Hi, I'm Nora O'Donnell, and this is Person to Person. Our guest today is sports broadcasting legend Jim Nance. Hello, friends. Jim Nance is one of the most famous sports broadcasters in history. And Virginia with the all-time turnaround title. And has been the voice of CBS Sports for over 30 years. The three-time Emmy Award winner covers the NFL, golf, and March Madness, the NCAA Men's Basketball Tournament. For the championship! You gotta believe, because just when people say you can't, you can, and UConn has won the national championship. This is his 37th and final year covering the college basketball playoffs. So we sat down with Nance for an intimate, person-to-person -person conversation. Jim Nance, thank you for joining us, or should I say hello, friend? Well, thank you for that, Nora. You are a great friend, and it's wonderful to be with you on this week. Um, final four week, it's a, it's a great celebration time in the world of sports. I mean, just incredible, this tournament. It has truly lived up to the phrase March Madness. All time. There, there's nothing to compare. This is my 37th. March Madness event, and I, I can't even begin to compare it to anything else. It is a collection of teams in Houston at the Final Four that really not many people forecast even one of them to be there. I guess there were people that had UConn and Nebraska brackets as a 4C, but after that, no, there wasn't a whole lot of support for Florida Atlantic or San Diego State or Miami. And I love it. Listen, we're so used to this being a gathering of the heavyweights. They're not here. What we do have here is a collection of underdogs, teams of dreamers. And that's what really has given the tournament through the years its spark. That's what's made it extra special is the fact that Cinderella would show up maybe in the first round, maybe they would steal a second game. But to make it all the way to the promised land, as we call it, the final four, uh, it's unprecedented to have this many dreamers. And I think we should sit back and embrace it and enjoy it. It's a new look. It's going to be a whole lot of fun. I love the way you put that, because this is the first time the final four will be played without a team seated better than a number four so much heart in these teams. Let's break them down. University of Miami, Florida Atlantic University, University of Connecticut, and San Diego State. How do you see them? Well, Connecticut has a very proud history, and they've been to the Final Four a number of times, and they've won championships. So uh, they, as uh, we make our way to the games on Saturday, they, they are the school that has the most foundational uh, success. But that doesn't mean a whole lot in this tournament, as we're finding out. You have Miami, a program that lacked funding and interest, so much so that in the 70s and into the 80s, the program was shut down. And now let's fast forward to where we are today. They brought in a coach, and Coach Jim Laranega, who had pulled off one of the great Cinderella stories in the history of the tournament at George Mason, getting them to the Final Four in 2006. And they're coming in here on a high. That Miami... UConn game is it's a magnificent matchup it's not one people have seen before it doesn't have the history people think of and they don't have anything to dial up as far as what that looks like but as a basketball purist it's a great matchup the other side are the real two underdogs because you have San Diego State again new territory never at the final four before um given little for some reason overlooked on the West Coast of what they've been doing since Steve Fisher resurrected the program. And now his protege, Brian Dutcher, runs the program. And uh, I'm excited to see the Aztecs there. They're uh, silently making their way through here, fully capable of winning a championship. Lastly, you have Florida Atlantic. Florida Atlantic didn't even have a Division I basketball program until the last 25 years. And no one, no one believed in them. Most people don't even know where they're from. Boca Raton, <laughs> Florida. Yeah, it's an interesting matchup. You got San Diego State and, and Boca Raton. I mean, you got the Battle of the Beaches, uh, Battle of the Surf and <laughs> National Semifinal. Uh, I don't know which school would be more fun to go to, but uh, I know that one of them is going to be playing for the national title on Monday. 
Well, uh, as always, Jim, your knowledge and enthusiasm about sports is so incredibly infectious. Um, and I know this is 37 years, but this will be your final March Madness. What made you want to step back? Very simple. I've done it for a long time. And I have the blessing of calling the lead game with Tony Romo on the NFL and anchoring our golf coverage. So with college basketball in the mix, as it has been all this time, I don't really ever have an off season. And I'm not complaining about manual labor here or overworking, but the travel, the wear and tear, and the fact that I'm a father of three with two young children at home, I needed to somehow get this thing to a manageable 40 weeks a year on the road, as opposed to what it is now. I call it, Nora, the golden hamster wheel. That's what I've been on. CBS has entrusted me now for almost two generations to go call the great championships of American sport. I've had my time to see it all, and I don't want to stop. I'm not retiring in any capacity. It's just I want to be home a little more, more often. My, my, my kids need daddy at home, yeah. and daddy needs to be on them more too. So something had to give. Uh, it was a difficult decision, but I don't regret it. I feel great about it. I am, Nora, a very nostalgic person. Uh, I get pretty emotional about almost anything. But don't confuse nostalgia with regret or sorrow. The nostalgia for me is rooted in gratitude. I have uh, just a huge heart-filled measure of thanks for being able to have the seat for that long to tell so many stories and document so many great events. And... Um, no regrets. I'm just uh, looking forward to one last celebration of college basketball, not me. You are, I think, the greatest of all time, and not just in sports broadcasting, but all of broadcasting, because what you have done, how hard you have worked, you are universally respected and loved by just about everybody. And your knowledge is it's encyclopedic. It really is. And um, so hats off to you, but I get it. It's an enormous amount of work. I love the process, but I have to tell you, that compliment you just paid me is, is probably the nicest thing anybody's ever said. So, and coming from you, Nora, I can't, I can't thank you enough. Yeah. Um, but you know, you're supposed to be objective here. This is a, it comes with your job. <laughs> uh, but thank and I guess, you. you know, the and I guess we're supposed to be humble. And so I appreciate your <laughs> humility. But you know, it, the, the hard work has paid off, Jim, because of, of how people regard you and, and how much they're you know, going to miss you doing this. Mm -hmm. You do have to put the time in before you get to the game or the golf event, whatever it might be. It probably doesn't register with people that there is kind of behind the scenes uh there is work to be done before you go on the air i think most people think you just pull up a chair and start calling a basketball games but those stories don't just drop into your head out of thin air they come from a lot of one-on-one -on -one discussion with players and coaches and fellow media members and the constant constant daily maintenance of reading. Mm -hmm. I fell asleep once again last night after one in the morning with my head on my iPad after just scanning through clip after clip after just looking for something I haven't seen before. And ultimately, I end up with a with a board uh, in front of me. This is not any as people think it's a cheat sheet. Well, let you me see. I, let me see it. Can you put can you or is well, it you can't give all your secrets yeah, away? I, no, it's fine. Uh, you can't read it when you're on the air. But um, uh, you know, you have all these little notes, if you can see, you know, it's just players. Wow. And, and again, it, it's, it just scratches the surface. It's not much. But what it does is it gives you during a commercial break a chance to sit down and review for a minute something that you might want to get into that helps tell the story of one of the players or coaches a little deeper. Mm -hmm. Basketball's like this, though. So those stories have to be, they have to be almost like little headlines, little nuggets, it's not long form storytelling like it is right. in golf. So I, I read, I read, I read, and then I have on separately on a legal pad, I have notes, pages after pages after pages. Ultimately, I just put a scratch out a few things on a board that resides in front of me when I call the game. Yeah. Interestingly, golf is the one that I don't prepare a board for. I want to get lost in that bubble that I'm watching at home. And I want to feel like I'm kind of just experiencing it as a viewer. So if it's coming to me naturally, 
uh, then I feel like it must be the right time to consider dropping that into the broadcast. It's understated. I enjoy the fact that um, golf allows you that chance to really let it start from here. Like, I feel like I'm, I, I let my heart lead me in, in golf. Um, and it's more of a fireside chat. There's a lot of, there's a lot of information that is compartmentalized in my head that will never see the light of air, CBS air, but it's there just in case, you know, I've got it <laughs> filed in my head. You never know when someone's going to walk up the 72nd hole of the masters on his way to a green jacket. In the back of my head, I remember a story they told me from 25 years ago, and now I'm ready to dispense with that story. Right. And I've been great that my memory has stayed sharp and allowed me to retain so much of this uh, in these little file cabinets that are inside of my head. Some people say you have a photographic memory. Is that true? Uh, I've I've been accused of that before. It's I can I can confirm now. Finally, it is not true. <laughs> it is not true. Uh, I just try really hard. Focus. I don't know. I, my memory is good, uh, and I'm grateful for that um, because Come. memory is an important part of my life. As you know, the whole Alzheimer's world is something that uh, struck. Uh, our family with my father losing his battle to Alzheimer's in 2008 and uh, after that opening up an Alzheimer's Research Institute in Houston. So when people talk about my memory, most people don't know that the whole memory angle for me has to do with trying to preserve it for everyone because I've seen it taken away up close as millions of people have. And millions of people in the country are right now living in that life where a loved one needs to be protected, needs to be watched, needs to have daily caregiving. I know it all. We're doing this for them. This is this is my life's work, is to try to find a way to where memory is uh, is not stripped from people later and, in life. And so many families applauding you for that, since it has affected all of us. Um, those late stage and sometimes middle age now diseases yeah. that are stripping people of their memories. And about that nostalgia that you talked about, Jim, Houston, the final four. I mean, it's like coming back full circle because you got your start in broadcasting <laughs> in Houston. Yeah. I went to school at the University of Houston to study communications. I wanted to work for CBS. That's plain and simple. What, what the goal was since I was a little boy, long before I went to college. I wanted to work for CBS. CBS had the Masters Tournament, and I love the way CBS presented the NFL. I was in awe of the presentation and the voices that came into my living room on weekends. I wanted to be one of those voices. So I studied communications, and then all of a sudden, opportunity presented itself. After a whole lot of persistence on my part, trying to wedge my way in and meet as many people as possible, and I'm very grateful that the city gave me that chance, and specifically that university gave me an opportunity to chase my dreams. Wow. When, when we come back, we'll ask Jim Nance where his famous phrase, hello friends, comes from. Jim Nance, welcome back. Well, anybody watching television knows it's a good game or tournament on CBS Sports when they hear you say, hello, friends. Where did that phrase come from? The phrase came from one little, what was supposed to be private, coded message to my father in late stage of Alzheimer's that I was thinking of him when I came on the air. Um, I was by his bedside. And it was 2002, and I said, Dad, when I come on the air this weekend, I'm going to look into that camera, and I'm going to say your name. My name is his name. I'm going to say, hello, friends, Jim Nance here. And I want you to know for that, that second that I'm looking at that camera, I'm looking at you, and I'm thinking of you. Now, the reality is I probably walked out of the room, and five seconds later, he had already forgotten it. But I like to think he retained it. Uh, after the show, I had a very close friend say, hey, I heard you come on the air today and say, hello, friends. What was that all about? I told him the backstory. He said, that sounds like you. You ought to do that all the time. I said, well, I'm you know, not looking for any signature line. And I'm, and I'm not, still not. Uh, he said, I think that's a nice story. And I've done it ever since. And for that one flicker of a second, 
when you come on the air and you look into that lens, like you do every night, you, there is no feedback. You don't see the millions of people that are on the other side of that lens. It's just a dark hole you're looking into. And it could be a Super Bowl with well over 100 million people. It could be a golf event with 10 million people. It doesn't matter. I'm going to come on the air and I'm going to have a little bit of anxiousness, you know, not necessarily nervousness, but that excitement about getting in the game. We all feel it. But when I look into the camera and I say, hello, friends, Jim Nance here, I still to this day, I think of my late father and I can see him and it relaxes me and I'm ready to go. Well, it relaxes us too, viewers, and allows us to settle in from all the troubles of life and enjoy sports. Jim, thank you. And when we come back, we're going to talk about golf and the Masters. Jim Nance, welcome back. Well, I wore my green in excitement for the upcoming Masters tournament, which I know you love and adore. Um, what do you see coming up this year? Somebody once said it's a tradition unlike any other, the Masters on CBS. And I get so excited just thinking about it. And yes, I, believe me, it wasn't lost that I, I saw you donning the green jacket. It's an interesting year in the game, as we all know. Um, there's been a lot of dissent away from the course. There's been the new Live Golf Tour and players defecting uh, over to play golf. Uh, on some tour other than the PGA Tour. Well, those who have qualified are going to be at Augusta. So you're going to see that story. Um, but I think that Rory McIlroy is always going to get the attention going into this event because it's the one major championship he hasn't won. Uh, he's won the other three legs of, of the Grand Slam, and he's just that one Masters green jacket away from being just the sixth to ever win the career Grand Slam. I'm saying all this because I think Rory mentally, physically, too, is in a great place for this to be the year. It's hard to predict who's going to win a golf tournament. It could, it could go so many different ways. But he has shouldered, if, if you want to call it a burden, uh, speaking up on behalf of the PGA Tour for the last year, time and time again about the disruption in the game away from the course with a new tour surfacing. And... He's been eloquent the way, and he's he's been uh, strongly opinionated, and I think that in a way has battle tested him to go through the emotions and the scrutiny and the pressure of trying to clear that last hurdle. I think he's ready to come down in uh, Butler Cabin on Sunday evening, April the ninth, and put on that green jacket. I really do. And Tiger Woods will return this year to play. He is going to give it his best efforts. He played in Los Angeles in February, and uh, he made the cut. That included a, an amazing round of 67 on Saturday. Uh, you know, Augusta's a difficult walk. The hardest thing for, for Tiger right now is uh, off of his accident, he had to have his leg completely restructured, his right leg, trying to push off of that, walk a golf course, it's a lot to ask, but you never put anything past Tiger. Uh, he, he has made a career out of defying all the predictions, expectations, naysayers, whatever you want to category you want to put it in. Um, but I'm thrilled he's going to be back. And look, it's, it's to me, it's the greatest tournament in the world. It's the, it's the greatest sporting event in the world. And um, yeah, I can't wait to get lost in it for the 38th time. So it's, it's coming up. And I learned in preparing for this interview that your dream final assignment in life includes <laughs> the Masters. It is. That's true. Uh, and I've, I've, I basically announced my retirement date, okay? It's the second Sunday in April of 2036. That would be my 51st Masters. And it would be the 100th playing of the Masters. And I would like to be there to see it. And I would like to be able to cross from the first century into the second century. And if I could just get a little greedy, I'd, li I'd like this guy right here to be the master's <laughs> champion. That's my son, Jameis. That's last summer, his first swing in competition at age six. 
I mean, look at the dirty toe. Look at the rotation. I mean, it's perfect. It's, it's perfect. I am not putting any pressure on him at all. I know it sounds like him, but uh, he has uh, been raised most of his life in Pebble Beach, California. Um, he thinks that golf is a mainstream sport. And um, you know what? He loves to compete at everything that he does. And by that time, he, he would be a young champion. He'd be like in the tiger category. May I show you one more? Yes, yes. This is age four. This was his golf swing at age four. He's now seven. Okay, wow. so watch this. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrific. Oh, I just Nothing put better. it out there. So what that means, <laughs> 20, 36, maybe I'll go a couple extra years and wait for him. 2036, that's 13 years from now. Young Henry Tracy will be 28 years old. So maybe we'll I'm be out there as parents, you know, I'm with the pimento cheese sandwich, a drink. <laughs> you and I can just walk the course. <laughs> Wouldn't that be? Hey, listen, you, you, you can't achieve it if you don't dream it. So he'll walk into Butler Cabin, and I will say, hello, son, and goodbye, friends. That's it. <laughs> I'm done. That would be my last. <laughs> <laughs> well, love you, Jim Nance, and love everything love you do. You. Thank you for sharing Thanks. your enthusiasm, you, like I said, and all your knowledge and making us all happy watching these great sporting events. Listen, you've been so generous always, and uh, this has meant a ton. So thank you so much. Thank Likewise. You know. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.